Hello everybody and welcome to the next lecture of 6838. Today we're going to continue our discussion of geodesic distances but following the same patterns where we ping pong back and forth between discrete and smooth mathematics, today we're going to talk about discrete aspects of computing geodesic distances. Our main focus in today's lecture is going to be on how to approximate geodesic distances on triangle meshes. We'll derive a technique called the fast marching algorithm, which is one of the most popular methods for doing this sort of computation, and then call out several others in the process. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the more modern applications of geodesic distance uh, computation, for example, on higher dimensional domains. So as a tiny bit of review, uh, hopefully you remember from our previous lecture, uh, what a geodesic distance is. <laughs> so a geodesic distance is nothing more than the shortest distance between two points on a surface where the path between those two points is constrained to move along that locally two-dimensional domain. Right, so like on the uh, double torus earth that we have on the top left here, uh, we can't just draw a straight line through extrinsic three-dimensional space from one flag to the other, but rather our geodesic path has to curve along with the curving of the surface. And essentially, the high-level takeaway from our discussion in the previous lecture is that there are many different queries or computations that you could do related to geodesic distance, and all of them are identical in Euclidean space, but they're all slightly different the second that you're on a curved domain. So for example, uh, one thing that we could do is compute sort of a path which is locally short. So this would correspond to like standing at a point on a surface, if you're an ant <laughs> and are constrained to walk along the surface and just walking forward without, you know, turning left or right. That's actually where we'll start today. We could talk about how single source all targets geodesic distance. So this would be like computing a function on our surface domain that tells us at every single point on our surface how far away that point is in geodesic distance from a source point. Remember that the difference between the upper right and the upper left is that in the upper left case, we could have a locally short path that is globally not the shortest path. For example, that green path, which kind of wraps around the double torus before hitting the target. Um, and essentially what ends up happening is that globally, you might have a different topology that you need for the shortest path. Like it cuts around a different uh, a handle in a different fashion, which the local sort of locally optimal computation can't see. And then finally, there are two more queries, which we haven't really talked about in theory because the theory of these two is a little bit less interesting relative to the first two, which is multi-source geodesic distance. So this would be like the distance to the closest point on the surface among this small point set. And then all pairs shortest geodesic uh, distance, which would be, you know, maybe I engineer a data structure where my goal is to accelerate queries that just take arbitrary pairs of points and give back their shortest path distance. We're only going to mention the last two in today's lecture because there isn't as much work on those problems as the first two, um, but we will call them out a little bit toward the end of our discussion. Now, most of our discussion today is going to be specific to triangle meshes, but one thing that's pretty straightforward is to make the algorithms that we talk about work for any manifold simplicial complex. Essentially, they're basically not going to change. The, uh, you can make any of these techniques like fast marching, the heat method, and so on uh, work for higher dimensional domains so long as they're discretized as a mesh. For example, a tet mesh in a volume or some crazy hyper tet mesh in a high dimensional space. At the very end of lecture, we're going to touch upon and at least give you a few interesting references into the literature for how you might cope with extremely high dimensional geodesic distance problems. We're mostly going to defer on those for now because many of the techniques in that space rely on a Riemannian metric, which we haven't defined yet in this class. Uh, but we'll see that geodesic distance queries are beginning to come back into focus as an interesting way to analyze uh, machine learning models. So for instance, if you think of your machine learning model as somehow learning and embedding for your data into some semantically meaningful space, then maybe the geodesic distance, and specifically the shortest geodesic from one data point to another, tells you something about the relationship between those two data points and maybe some interesting things in between them. So anyway, that's our high level introduction. Let's get started with our discussion for the day. So we're gonna start 
on the upper left here and talk about how we might define what it means to be a locally shortest path on a triangulated domain. So just as a tiny bit of review, remember that essentially we spent a lot of effort in our previous lecture deriving an ODE, which ended up being fairly intuitive, <laughs> even if your instructor, instructor talked a little bit in circles around it, um, which was how to define geodesics locally. So remember that if I have a geodesic curve, gamma of t, and maybe just for convenience, I'll think of gamma as being parametrized by arc length, then one condition that we can check to see if we're kind of locally short or locally straight as path might be the following, which is to look at the projection of a gamma double prime of t onto the tangent plane at gamma of t of our manifold, and that we want this thing to be identically equal to uh, zero. Right? So this is for uh, curves that are parameterized by arc length. And so remember essentially what this condition was telling us, right? It was saying that if we look at the forces that are experienced by a car that's driving along our surface, right? That's like the second derivative, roughly. And we uh, specifically take the component in the tangent plane, so we ignore any component that is normal to our surface, well, then there shouldn't be any force at all. So that is to say that if I'm a passenger in the car that's driving along a geodesic, I may feel a force just to keep me on the surface as opposed to just, you know, driving off like a ramp. Uh, but I shouldn't feel forces due to hitting the accelerator, right, because it's parametrized by arc length. And I also shouldn't feel forces due to turning the steering wheel because that would make my curve not a geodesic. Right, so we derived this formula by starting for, with the formula for arc length and basically taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero, um, the fancy term for that being taking the variational derivative. So one of the interesting techniques tries to, on, on a triangle mesh, tries to ask the question of what would it take to take this local condition and make it work for paths on a triangulated or piecewise flat domain, like a polyhedral surface. Um, now this goes back to Poltier and Schmies um, in this uh, SIGGRAPH course notes on uh, shortest geodesics on polyhedral surfaces. I'm not 100% sure there may be earlier references than that. But the basic question here is, what does it mean to solve an initial value problem for shortest paths? So remember the initial value problem, again, is kind of like this exponential map object, right? I'm standing at a point, I have some tangent vector at that point, and I just want to start walking straight. Now, there's basically three cases on a triangulated domain that we have to worry about, right? And essentially, this has to do with whether or not our point is in the interior of a triangle, on an edge, or at a vertex. Now, in the interior of a triangle, right, so if, if I'm inside of a uh, triangle, then it's pretty straightforward what I should do <laughs> to compute a shortest path, at least locally, right? Because of course, you know, a triangle is a flat domain, so a shortest path is nothing more than a straight line segment. So what is that uh, saying? So essentially, you know, if I'm inside of a triangle and I'm given some point and a tangent vector, <laughs> you know, then clearly the initial value problem that I should be solving here this follows it in a straight line until I run into an edge or a vertex of the triangle. Uh, okay, so now we're in good shape. And, but there's, now we have to figure out what to do in the other two cases. So for example, once our geodesic path runs into an edge of the triangle, how do we continue? So in other words, how do we cope with edges? So in the edge case, one thing that we can note is that we really don't expect shortest paths between points to change if we hinge two edges or two triangles about their shared edge, right? Because how do you compute the shortest path? Well, it would just be the sum of the lengths of the two segments. So let's draw this. So here's maybe, I can never, I always struggle with this picture. Let's see if I can manage to do it. So here's one triangle. Well, let's say that I have another triangle that shares an edge uh, with it. So maybe the triangle goes, I don't know, in like this. Uh, like that. OK. And now I want the shortest path between this point and this triangle, that point on that triangle. 
obviously the shortest path, you know, it's going to go up to the shared edge and then kind of, you know, go across the back through the other triangle uh, to that other vertex. And the question is, what does it mean to be the shortest path? Well, one thing that I could do is to take this angle here and kind of hinge these triangles about their shared edge, right? So in other words, I could map this problem to just two triangles that share an edge, like uh, this maybe. So here's tri uh, triangle one and triangle two. And I can do that without changing any of the edge lengths. Okay, and essentially there's a pretty simple claim here, which is that if I have the shortest path between two points, well, then what should that look like when I unhinge? Well, clearly, it should look like a straight line, right? Because, for example, if it went through some other point on the shared edge and then back down, I could make my curve shorter by just moving this point down. Okay? So this gives us a condition for how we can continue a local geodesic path uh, along an edge of our triangle mesh, right? So the way that we do it, just kind of inverting this picture that I've drawn here, is that we say, okay, once, you know, if I'm solving an initial value problem, I'm walking along my triangle mesh and I run into an edge, then to, f to figure out how I should continue in the next triangle, I can kind of unhinge it, mathematically speaking, of course, and then just continue in a straight line. Now, there are many ways to understand this condition. Remember that it essentially, if we kind of go back, you know, in our, our, our initial value problem version of the geodesic, in some sense, we're trying to figure out, you know, what is the initial velocity of our geodesic curve once it passes through this point on the shared edge, right? Because once we have that, then we can just continue in a straight line. So thinking about initial velocities really is thinking about angles, right? Because the, the, we know that the norm of the velocity should be one. It's parametrized by arc length. So here's one interesting equivalent condition, which is to actually return to the geodesic ODE here. Right? So there's so many different ways to understand that expression. One of them is that you know, if I look at the curvature of a geodesic projected onto the tangent plane of my surface, it should be zero. OK, so if I unravel two triangles so that they're flat, they're in the same shared plane, then remember that essentially discrete curvature from several lectures ago, we related to turning angle in the plane, right? So remember if we have a plane curve like this that we can think of as a sequence of line segments, then somehow the integrated curvature looks like the turning angle of our curve. So if we want a geodesic, then, well, there shouldn't be any turning angle. Or to put it differently, if you look at the amount of angle on the left of our vertex, and the amount of angle on the right, those two should be equal, right? They're both just 180 degrees, or, you know, pi uh, radians, if you want to be fancy. So essentially, all I'm doing is telling you many different ways to understand the same condition, which is how to continue a geodesic curve from one triangle to the next, assuming that the curve moves along a line. Unfortunately, we're still not quite done, right? The third case of course, because I saved it for last, is the most annoying, <laughs> which is what happens when my curve runs into a vertex? Now, in this case, what we're going to see, which is a little surprising, is that there's a really weird interface between smooth and discrete math. So in particular, when I was talking about the edge case, <laughs> edge case, I essentially told you two different conditions that I could check uh, for how to be a uh, geodesic curve between points, right? So one of them is just that it really is the shortest length of a series of line segments connecting those two points, right? So I, I look at the shortest curve between two points and, and I, I try to construct that out of line segments in the triangle planes. And the other is one where I kind of look at the angle on the left and the right of a curve as it travels along the mesh and I want those two things to be equal because somehow that's kind of like having zero geodesic curvature. Unfortunately, at a vertex, it turns out that you, you can't make both of those work at the same time. This is a little bit surprising. Um, so here's a bit of an intuition, uh, which comes from maybe kind of origami style reasoning. 
So here's what we're going to do. Hopefully you can understand this picture drawn here. This is borrowed from the uh, course notes I referenced in the previous slide, where we've taken vertices of two different signs of curvature, <laughs> right? Positive uh, Gaussian curvature and negative Gaussian curvature, and tried to unravel them into the plane. Now, remember with positive Gaussian curvature, right? That's kind of like a bowl-shaped domain. One way that I could unravel the plane is to just take one of the outgoing edges from the vertex and cut along it with scissors. And then what I'll get is a transition from the top to the bottom here, right? And remember the having positive uh, Gaussian curvature, right, is saying 2 pi minus the sum of angles greater than uh, 0. So in particular, the sum of interior angles, you know, if uh, my Gaussian curvature is positive, right, then the sum of the theta i's, you know, just by moving to the other side of this, whoop, this inequality right here, is going to be less than 2 pi. So in other words, when I cut and I smash things into the plane, there's going to be a hole. You know, similarly, uh, if I have uh, Gaussian curvature, uh, oops, oh no, less than zero, uh, this board is hard to erase, uh, then, then what happens, right, it's a hyperbolic vertex, like the right-hand side, and we have that the sum of theta i's is greater than 2 pi, which means that I kind of have excess amounts of angle, so when I cut and unfold into the plane, I get the picture on the right-hand side. Now, here's the thing. Computing shortest paths, like really the chain of line segments that minimizes distances, I claim, and I think you would all agree with me, that if I can cut triangles, lay them out in the plane where they have shared edges, and then draw a, uh, a straight line, then that straight line mapped back to the original mesh is an honest to goodness shortest path between two points. So let me draw a picture of what I mean. So, so let's say we have that spherical vertex, like on the left-hand side, okay? So here is the spherical vertex. We've got one, two, three, four triangles coming out of it. And then this is the sort of missing angle. Maybe it's sad because it's missing. Um, okay, and let's say that I take these two points and I connect them with a straight line. Now, this straight line I could map back to the original curved domain, right, back to the original polyhedral mesh, and pretty clearly it would be the shortest path from this point to that point, at least locally, you know, assuming there's not some other crazy path um, hiding in the, the topology somewhere. So, okay, so this is some condition for being the shortest path, right? I can unravel, draw a straight line, and look at this path. But we can also define something called a straightest geodesic, which looks at the angles to the left and to the right of, an, of, of our curve as we draw it as a polyline, and asks that those two objects are the same. Right? That's sort of this other definition that we talked about here. The question is, are they the same? The answer, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, surprisingly, is no. And in fact, even more surprisingly, the situation depends on the curvature at a vertex. So remember that we have two notions, the straightest geodesic and the shortest geodesic. Now it turns out that there's actually two different facts that we can derive about this uh, scenario and they depend on the curvature of our domain. So there's the spherical case and then there's a hyperbolic case. Okay, so let's actually do the hyperbolic case first because it's a little bit easier to draw and think about. So I'm going to move that out of the way so I have a little bit of extra space. So uh, if we do the hyperbolic uh, case here, well, essentially, remember what that means, right? That's the picture on the right-hand side here. It means that when we unfold our surface, or our, our vertex, by just cutting into one edge and wrapping into the plane, there's going to be overlap because we have excess of 2 pi angles, right? So like here's the uh, the picture that they draw. Let me see if I can copy it. If you haven't figured out by now, your instructor is a terrible artist and is insanely uncomfortable drawing live in the course here. Um, but anyway, so if this is the edge that they cut, then maybe what ends up happening because you have extra angle is that there's like one additional triangle, which uh, it's unraveled in some way like that, right? So here's the, 
extra amount of angle, which is making our uh, point uh, hyperbolic. Oh, this picture is not so bad. <laughs> okay, and now let's say that I want to compute a shortest path from one point to another. Okay, so specifically, just to be kind of annoying, one thing I could do is take a point here and a point here and connect them with a straight line through this vertex. Now take a look. This is pretty clearly the shortest path from one point to another, but notice that it's actually somehow, something kind of weird is happening here, right? The, 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 so our goal is to solve an initial value problem, right? So we're given this point and a tangent vector pointing out of this point, and our goal is to find a curve which sort of locally looks geodesic. So what ends up happening? We follow our straight line until it runs into this vertex, and we have to decide two things, actually. One of them is what triangle to continue our path on. And then the second one is inside of that triangle, what direction should we follow? Okay, so take a look. We ran into this vertex here. Now there's actually more than one shortest path that we could compute. We could follow onto the left triangle or onto the right triangle because they overlap and either one of these when we fold into the plane is going to give us a shortest path. It's going to give us a straight line segment. So this is one of these cases where theory and uh, where the, the smooth theory and the discrete theory actually don't align, right? In the smooth theory, there's a, you know, just by existence uniqueness of ordinary differential equation, you know, so long as your surface is smooth, you have a unique geodesic locally, just like a direction you can walk and continue going in a straight line. On a polyhedral domain, if I follow in a straight line and run into a vertex, and now I want to know where should I go to continue being a shortest path, well, then somehow there's actually more than one in the hyperbolic case, right? It splits. I can go into either one of these triangles when it's uh, folded back into the hyperbolic domain. Now, that being said, there's uh, only one sort of straightest uh, geodesic, and, and the way that you can figure that out is by summing up angles on the left and the right-hand side. So, for instance, in this case, let's say that I go onto the triangle on the top, right? So that corresponds to the left side, right? So in that case, well, what's going to happen? On the left side of my geodesic curve, right, this angle here is going to be 180 degrees, but actually on the right-hand side of our curve, it's going to be more than 180 degrees once we unfold this triangle here. So this is kind of a tricky matter. <laughs> uh, and, and, and in fact, um, because we can sort of unhinge and move our triangles around any which way, there are actually many different shortest paths. Right? So on our original uh, hyperbolic domain, somehow there's a whole fan worth of directions that we could go that kind of look like solutions to this initial value problem. But there's only one straightest segment, and that's the one where essentially I'm going to take the curvature, the integrated Gauss curvature at this vertex, and just divide it in half between left and right. Okay, so in other words, you know, maybe I look at a different version of this uh, domain where I actually glue these two edges together, like I cut somewhere else. Oh no, this pen is falling apart. So here's. Uh, you know, the same two triangles, I have an arrow, but here I'm gluing them together instead of tearing them apart. And essentially our argument has shown that there's an entire kind of cone worth of directions that I could move given our geodesic path that's ended up at this vertex, which essentially corresponds to everything between the point that I've drawn restricted to the left triangle and the same point restricted to the right triangle underneath. But among these different directions, there's a unique one, which is the straightest, which is to say, at this vertex, I look at the excess angle that I have, and I distribute it among the left and the right-hand sides of the curve here. So in any event, to summarize the hyperbolic case, if I'm trying to solve this ODE where I have this curve that looks like a geodesic, right? I keep walking. As long as I'm inside a triangle, I follow a straight line. If I run into an edge, I unfold and then continue to follow a straight line. If I run into a vertex, I can be locally shortest by following anything in a whole kind of window worth of edges, or worth of directions, rather. 
but there's only one, which is straightest, where I calculate the angles on my left and right hand side and want them to be equal, which is in some sense some version of this curvature condition here. Okay, so now let's erase and think about the spherical one, which at least to me is a little bit harder to think about. Okay, so now let's think about the positive Gaussian curvature or sphere, spherical slash elliptic uh, case. So that's illustrated on the left-hand side part of this slide here. So remember that when we take scissors to our triangle mesh at that vertex, uh, you know, at one edge coming out of our vertex, now when we flatten things out, uh, because of our curvature condition, what we're gonna end up with is a hole, like what we've illustrated. Okay, so, so let's maybe copy the uh, picture that we have here. Um, so, you know, even though I'm drawing a big rectangle, you can think of this rectangle as, as some triangles if you want. Oops, this, this marker isn't working. Hopefully this one will. A little better. Um, so maybe there's, so here's our vertex. You know, there's edges coming out, but they actually don't matter. But we have, uh, you know, maybe here's some more triangles that are coming out of our vertex, like what's shown on the slide. Okay, so we have a path, right? Our locally straightest geodesic path is moving forward, and by bad luck, it turns out this can actually happen with pretty high probability. You, you, you run into this vertex here, and you have to figure out where to go to continue being a geodesic curve, right? We're trying to mimic solving the ODE here. Well, what are our options? Like, somehow looking at this picture, it seems like we might want to continue onto one of these two triangles, and the question is, which one? <laughs> And remember that we have these two different conditions that we'd like to be true for a geodesic curve, right? One is that it's locally a shortest path between points, right? Like meaning if I grab some small neighborhood uh, on my, my geodesic curve, it really does look like a shortest path. And the other one is that it's straightest, right? I look at the total angle on the left and the right hand side and they sum to the same values, which is typically like pi on one side and pi on another if I'm in a flat region, but then at a vertex, something else has to happen. Okay, so what's gonna happen? Well, I have to go somewhere, right? Like maybe I move along an edge, you know, like one of these guys, or maybe I go to the interior of a triangle. Probably wouldn't do that, but I probably end up in one of these edges. And that somehow feels sensible, right? So maybe I continue my geodesic path like that. Here's the kind of interesting observation, which in retrospect is pretty obvious. No matter what straightest geodesic I draw, right? Notice that this angle sum and this angle sum that I've drawn it are about the same, so maybe that's the straightest geodesic. No matter what straight, straightest geodesic I draw, it is never a shortest path in the positive curvature case because, well, except in a few boundary cases, a shortest path just can't go through a positive curvature vertex. Do you see that? So here I just drew you a shortest path. Right, it's the dotted line on the slide if you prefer not to look at my, my ugly drawing. And the point here is that your curve gamma ran into P, it had to go somewhere, but the second that it did, right, in the interior of either triangle, I could have drawn a straight line back to my original starting point in this unfolded picture and gotten a curve with shorter uh, length. Okay, so this is sort of a, a pictorial illustration of a mathematical argument, which is essentially saying if I'm at a positive, if I have a curve, which goes through a positively curved vertex and then back out, it can't possibly be the shortest path between two points uh, locally because I can always kind of replace a short segment around that positive curvature vector, uh, vertex with something shorter. So as written here, the straightest geodesic through that vertex is never a shortest path, even locally, right? I can zoom in to some tiny neighborhood around this vertex and no matter how close I zoom in, that curve is never the closest point, right? I can always draw some straight line connecting things that is shorter. Okay, so stepping back 10 feet, essentially what have we learned so far? What we learned is that as always, it is impossible to conserve all the structure we could possibly want when going from geodesic curves on smooth surfaces to geodesic curves on triangle meshes, right? So geodesic curves on triangle meshes have so many different properties, right? Uh, if they solve that initial value problem, then for one, uh, there is no uh, curvature in the tangent plane, right? My, my curve doesn't steer left or steer right. 
And the easiest way to translate that to a discrete condition will be to look at a locally straightest curve. So like the total curvature on the left and right hand sides of our curve is the same. Uh, but unfortunately for us, those two conditions aren't the same because when I compute shortest paths, well, what ends up happening? I can no long, I can never have a straightest geodesic, which is also a shortest path, if it goes through one of these positively curved vertices. What does that mean? Well, and then moreover, by the way, our hyperbolic case says that if we follow that we want shortest paths, then our initial value problem is ill-posed, right? Because if I run into a hyperbolic vertex, I actually have multiple directions I could go and continue being the shortest path uh, moving forward using that local condition. So what does this say? It says that essentially this ODE perspective of just point your toes in some direction and start walking is actually ill-posed on a triangle mesh because when you run into a vertex, well, the condition of being the shortest path no longer is unique. There's a whole fan worth of directions I can walk and be the shortest path from like, you know, right before I walked into that vertex. And moreover, there is no direction that I can walk from a vertex which is positively curved that maintains the shortest path condition because the second that I do, suddenly there was some other path that would be shorter from like, the millisecond behind where I, I was and the millisecond forward in time. And, and so this means that really these are, that initial value problem is quite tricky to solve on a mesh. Um, incidentally, even coding any of these things, whether it's you know computing the straightest geodesic. So the straightest geodesic problem is well posed. It's just not the same as shortest because of the positive curvature uh, condition. Coding this stuff up is actually still a giant pain um, thanks to you know, you kind of have to do all kinds of data structures to walk around a mesh in an efficient fashion. Incidentally, just this year, uh, there was an interesting, well, I guess last year now, there was an interesting paper that was introduced at SIGGRAPH Asia that I encourage you guys all to take a look at, um, which claims, it has a bold title, you know, you can find geodesic paths in triangle meshes just by flipping edges. Um, so this is kind of an interesting idea, which is essentially taking a path on a triangle mesh which starts out by moving along just the edges of that triangle mesh and then is trying to make it shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, the way that their optimization technique works is kind of interesting. They introduce an operation which is very common in remeshing where like maybe I have two triangles that share an edge like this and I just erase this edge and replace it with another edge going in the opposite direction. I'll kind of like flip it 90 degrees and say, okay, so let's say that I have a path, uh, for example, from this vertex to this vertex, which is constrained to move along the edges of my mesh. Okay, well, along my original mesh, that path isn't so good, um, but if I flip this edge, so I'm willing to change my mesh topology, I can now find a uh, shortest path, which is better. Um, this requires doing your triangulation intrinsically, meaning that if these two, uh, triangles are actually kind of folded against each other. You want to flip the edge, but you don't want an edge to kind of cut down through 3D space. So you, you really are like kind of thinking of this as a folded pair of triangles in the sort of original pair of triangles on your mesh. I described that really poorly, but um, I encourage you guys to take a look at this interesting new paper. Um, this is another way to compute uh, geodesic paths that locally minimize length. And I guess uh, what we showed in the previous slide is that once this algorithm converges, it should be the case that those paths never pass through a, uh, what, a positively curved vertex, because if we do, we know they're not locally uh, shortest. So in any event, I'll let you take a look at this interesting paper for more details, but I thought I'd highlight it as, as just a new development in this area uh, presented at SIGGRAPH Asia in 2020. Okay, so let's erase and continue. Okay. So, so far our discussion has involved computing locally shortest paths, that like ordinary differential equation style problem where I'm standing at a point and I start walking forward and trying to draw a path behind me which just continues being locally shortest, meaning if I drew, you know, followed the segment backward in time a little bit, I would know it would be a geodesic between where I am now and where I was a few milliseconds before. But probably the main applications of computing geodesics uh, 
are actually for a different problem, which is to compute the length of the globally shortest path. Right, so in other words, to compute the lengths of the shortest path from a single vertex on our triangle mesh to all of the other ones, similar to the output of Dijkstra's algorithm. Now, speaking of Dijkstra's algorithm, our starting point for algorithms that have this style of output is the fact that we already know how to compute shortest paths on graphs, right? If we just had vertices and edges and not these pesky triangles, then our undergrad algorithms class tells us exactly what to do. The headache is trying to figure out how to make shortest paths between vertices that can cut through the interiors of triangles. So the question we'll try to answer is whether we can use graph-based shortest path algorithms to carefully compute geodesics. And we're going to answer that yes in two different ways. The first way is by deriving a technique called fast marching, which is a practical and easily implemented algorithm for computing geodesic distances, you know, single source, all target geodesic distances on a triangle mesh. And we'll briefly mention the MMP algorithm, which is how to not just approximate geodesic distance, but compute the honest to goodness length of the shortest path on a triangle mesh really considered as a big collection of triangles linked together. So as a bit of review, in case you haven't encountered algorithms for computing shortest paths on graphs, let's uh, fill you in really fast. So here are some useful principles. Let's say that I'm computing this function, which is at every point on a domain, the shortest path from that point back to some source. And I think about those shortest paths. Well, there's essentially two almost tautological principles that are used to build shortest path computation algorithms, right? One of them is that, well, my shortest path had to come from nowhere, right? It's not like paths can disappear and then reappear somewhere else on our domain. They're continuous. And moreover, probably the more important one, is that every single piece of a shortest path is optimal. What do I mean by that? I mean that like if I go from A to B to C, and I think of that whole path from A through B into C at a, as the shortest path from A to C, then if I restrict that path and just look at the part of it from A to B, that had better be the shortest path from A to B, right? Because if not, I could replace it with a different one and also shorten the path from A to C. So what is that saying? That's saying if I walk backward from B to A along the shortest path from A to B, then as I walk, you, you know, every single one of those is, is along the shortest path. There's, there's no case where you somehow leave the optimal regime and then come back. So built on these observations is a very famous technique for computing shortest paths on graphs. So it's called Dijkstra's algorithm. I'm going to assume that most students in this class know this algorithm. If they don't, then they might want to pause this video and give the Wikipedia page a quick read. But I think this is a pretty well-known technique. So in Dijkstra's algorithm, this is for a graph, right? So there's no triangles anymore. It's just a collection of vertices and edges. Dijkstra's algorithm, its job in life is to compute uh, basically an array of values, uh, which I've called D here, which is the distance from a source vertex V0 to every other vertex on my domain. So Dijkstra's algorithm initializes by setting the distance to V0 to 0. I think we can all agree that that's correct. And essentially it's going to always maintain an overestimate of, of distance, right? So in particular, we'll say the distance to V0 is zero, the distance to all other vertices is infinity, and we're gonna maintain a set S, which we're gonna think of as the set of vertices whose distance we're confident in. Like, so we, we know that there doesn't exist some path to one of these vertices with a shorter distance than what we've seen so far. So then Dijkstra's algorithm iteratively does the following. It looks in the set of vertices for which we are not confident in the current distance value. It chooses the closest one, right? That's uh, essentially what you're seeing in the first line here. Adds that vertex to the set, and then for every neighbor of that vertex, it updates the distance. It says, okay, either leave the distance alone, that's the first term in the min, or construct a path which is through that vertex V along edge E to the neighbor. So as a bit of a sanity check, I would encourage you to make sure that you at least understand what will happen in the very first algorithm, or a very first iteration of this algorithm. So recall that we initialize d of v naught to zero and d of everything else to be infinity, right? So um, clearly, in our first uh, iteration, the v that it'll choose is v naught and add it to s, which is fine. We know that we can't get any closer than distance zero. <laughs> uh, and then it's going to look at all of the edges out of v naught 
and update the distance to the neighbors to be the length of that edge. So at least in the first iteration, this is clearly the right thing to do. Um, there's a very simple inductive proof, which essentially says in every step of this technique, um, S remains optimal, meaning that you know, if I put a vertex into S, the value in D is truly the length of the shortest path. Okay, so that's Dijkstra's algorithm. Again, it's something I'm assuming that you guys know. And if you kind of look at these steps, you can convince yourself that the runtime of Dijkstra's algorithm is proportional to the number of edges plus V log V. Um, there's some specialized data structures that are basically priority queues for this argmin in the very first line here, right? which is what takes all the time secretly, because you have to find the next vertex that you're going to process, and you don't want to have to iterate over the entire graph to do that. Okay, so this is Dijkstra's algorithm. There's so many different interpretations. The one that's most convenient in our geometry course is to think of it as sort of computing a set of advancing fronts, right? So what that means is that, uh, you know, our central vertex here is maybe the most red point on this slide. And then essentially you can think of that S as the sort of bigger and bigger neighborhood. Uh, and one thing that you can observe is that actually if you look at points being added to S in the steps of Dijkstra's algorithm, they're added in increasing order of distance. You'll never add something farther away and then closer um, to S. It's actually just a simple byproduct of this algorithm, right? Because the very first line says, find me the, the thing with the smallest distance. Uh, so in the slides I've included, or rather borrowed from a colleague, a simple example of what this looks like. So here, gr the green region indicates um, that these are vertices whose distance is known, right? So in our first iteration, it's empty. Then we add the vertex of distance zero. Inside of each of the vertices is the current estimate for the distance. So you can see that it gets updated here. I guess 99 is equal to infinity <laughs> uh, to the length of the edges. And slowly the set expands until it covers the entire graph. OK, so what we're going to talk about next is an extension of Dijkstra's algorithm that can deal with geodesic distances on a triangulated domain. And this technique is called fast marching, and it's one of the most classical and well-known techniques for computing shortest paths on a triangulated mesh. What we're going to see is that fast marching is not exact. It doesn't give me the true length of the shortest path, like you know the minimum number of line segments to get from vertex A to vertex B along this set of, of, of triangles. But it does give us an approximation of geodesic distance, and in practice, is an extremely good one. Uh, also, there is convergence theory out there telling us that as you refine your mesh under certain conditions, the estimate you get from fast marching really is the correct estimate. So what's the fundamental problem we're trying to solve? Essentially, you can see it in this slide here. So here are two triangles that share an edge. And this is the difference between shortest path on graphs and shortest paths on triangle meshes. Namely, okay, so the shortest path from the left vertex to the right vertex on this slide here, uh, if we're restricted to move along the graph of triangle mesh edges, it's gonna be this red curve, right? It goes up and then back down. But the reality is that our shortest path, just like when we talked about you know, the straightest paths before, should be this green object, right? It just moves in a straight line that goes right through the interior of the uh, two triangles. So that's the basic issue, and what it suggests is that if we want to adapt Dijkstra's algorithm to the surface uh, shortest path case, we're going to have to consider not just you know, outgoing edges from a vertex, but also adjacent triangles. And indeed, that's precisely what we're going to do. So here is where the approximation happens in Dijkstra's algorithm. If you look at the level sets of the distance function, along a domain, it can get pretty complicated pretty fast. So when I say level sets, these are like all the points of constant distance from the starting point. So this would you know, be just drawing concentric circles if your domain were the plane. <laughs> but on a triangulated mesh, those level sets have like little circular segments, but then of course something has to happen when they go from one triangle to another, and moreover, uh, one thing you can kind of convince yourself is that like, well, the shortest path getting me into the middle of this triangle over here, it passed through a whole sequence of triangles before me. And so actually, I don't just get a single circle as my wavefront inside of every triangle. It could be a bunch of little circular segments. So what fast marching does, at least version zero of fast marching, 
is it makes a weird approximation. This is called the planar front approximation. And the idea here is that if we look at the level set or the front of this distance function, right? So that's shown by like the curves on this 3D model here. Then we're going to approximate those locally with planar objects. So what does that mean? So for instance, let's say that I have a single triangle. So here uh, is a triangle. Uh, if that triangle is my entire triangle mesh, and this is my source point v naught, right? Then the planar, or rather, the fronts of the distance function obviously are going to be circles that are, you know, centered at v naught. But now, if I look at some far, far away triangle along my triangle mesh. Like, sure, there's still a bunch of circular arcs. In fact, they don't have to be all the same because they might have come from different triangles. But, well, one thing you can see is that they're nearly flat, right? And, and this is just a reflection of the fact that if I have concentric circles, the bigger my circle is, the smaller the curvature, right? Big circles have small curvature. Remember that curvature looks like 1 over radius. So. Essentially, what ends up happening in the fast marching algorithm is that we're going to locally compute the best planar or straight line approximation of our advancing front of geodesic distance and then use it to advance our geodesic distance a little bit more. And this is definitely an approximation. In fact, one question you should ask is where is this approximation good and where is it bad? And just like I talked about, this approximation is going to be really bad close to our starting point v naught, but then as we move farther and farther out, it becomes better. Okay, so let's fill in a little bit of details. So the basic point here is that rather than dealing with these curved fronts of shortest paths in the interiors of triangles, like that's a little bit complicated, so we're gonna approximate it with something like the picture on the right-hand side, right? So there's just some sort of level set with straight lines which is moving forward. A different way to put it is that the distance function as a function of, you know, just points in the interior of the triangle, well, if your function is affine, this is like a straight line, then it can be written in the form that we've written on the slide here, right? We can write uh, the, the distance to any point x in the interior of a triangle. For now, we'll think of the triangle sitting in the inside of the plane. So x is in uh, R2. We can do that by just like locally rotating our triangle mesh into the plane just for convenience, while we do computation with this one triangle, then we can say we're going to approximate, it's really an approximation, uh, as n transpose x plus c. It's kind of like ax plus b, but you know, now, we're, now we're in two dimensions. So n here is 2 by 1, as is x, and c is a scalar. Well, what do we know? I mean, we don't want to totally give up every property of being a distance function. And one thing that you could convince yourself is that like, if this were a distance function, like if it satisfied the Iconal equation, remember that one from the previous lecture? So what is the Iconal equation? It says the norm of the gradient of the distance function had better equal 1. So here, what is the gradient? It's just this constant vector n. Um, so in particular, we kind of conclude or, you know, in our approximation, if it is a distance function, then we're going to assume that the, the length of this vector, which is currently unknown, is equal to 1 right, for our, our advancing front. So let's think about how we could build some version of Dijkstra's algorithm that works on a triangle mesh domain. So remember the basic outline. We initialize the distance to our source point to be 0. And now we're going to start choosing other points on our mesh which are nearby and updating their distances. OK, so how could we do that? So what does that mean? That means that now if we're at a vertex, we need to look at all the neighbors of that vertex and see if we can compute the shortest path that starts at that vertex and goes on to the next neighbor. But rather than looking at vertices, we're going to look at triangles. In particular, our update step is going to do something like this. We're going to solve a problem which says, suppose I know the distance from my source point to two out of the three vertices of a triangle. And the question is, can I find the distance to the third vertex of that triangle? Okay, so here, let's say I have a triangle x1, x2, and x3. For convenience, we're going to assume that 
uh, we're going to move the vertex uh, x3 to the origin. We can do that just by shifting our triangle. Um, and obviously, that's not going to affect distances as long as we just rigidly move the whole setup. Uh, and we're going to assume that all of the xi's are in the plane. What we're going to see is that this isn't going to be necessary when we write down the fast marching algorithm, but just for our local computation, it's going to make our life a little easier. So what do we know? We know the distance from some unknown source point far away to x1. We're going to call that d1. We know the distance from that same unknown source point far away to x2. We'll call that d2. And we're going to know or make the assumption that the front of distance values is this linear function, right? d um, is, is given by n transpose x plus, plus c, but these guys are unknown. So given those two facts in the upper green box, our goal is to find the distance to our last vertex, x3. Now, just because we put x3 at the origin, now you can see why uh, this is kind of convenient mathematically. Essentially, that's the same thing as computing this value c. OK? So let's actually do this calculation. We'll see that it's not too hard. So let's move this into the slide. So first of all, we're going to make a few definitions just to make our life easier. Uh, we can define a vector, which is 2 by 1, which is like all the distances that we know, d1 and d2, like that. And moreover, we can make a 2 by 2 matrix, right, which is whose columns are x1 and x2. All right, so this is 2 by 1, and this is 2 by 2. Well, what do we know? Well, if you think about it, so we know that the dot product between n and x1 plus c is equal to d1, the dot product between n and x2 plus c is equal to d2. So if we just vectorize that notationally, because we're all grown-ups here, we should be able to write things in terms of matrices and vectors, we get that d is equal to x transpose n plus... Now, c is a scalar, so we're going to say c times the vector of all ones, right? So this is just the vector 1, 1, like that. So hopefully you follow that essentially all we've done so far is to take those first two equations in the green box and write them in a nice matrix vector product kind of way. And now our goal, our goal is to figure out what d3, or equivalently what this value of c is. We're going to see that the value of c takes a nice form where these assumptions end up kind of dropping out. So they're, they're just computational conveniences and nothing more. OK, so the first thing that we can do is we can solve this expression for n. OK, so here's how uh, we can do that. So remember that x here is a 2 by 2 matrix. And we're going to assume that it's invertible. Uh, there's some boundary case where maybe it's not. I think I'll let you guys think about that case at home. And you'll see that it really shouldn't happen in this, this algorithm. But let's say that we multiply both sides by the inverse of x transpose. Uh, in that case, we can try and solve for n, right? So what we're going to see is that n, let's see if I can do this without <laughs> uh, looking at my notes, uh, is going to equal the inverse of x transpose. Remember that transpose and inverse uh, commute, so I can use this ambiguous notation, uh, times d minus, well, x inverse transpose also has to get multiplied by this thing here. So we can say like minus c times 1, like that. OK. So our goal was to solve for c. And we actually have two unknowns here, right? What do we know? We know d and we know x, but we don't know n and we know, don't know c. So we need to eliminate n if our, our real only goal here is to compute c. And here's how we can do it, which is pretty sneaky. Well, recall that we know one additional thing. We know that the norm of the vector n is equal to 1. So in particular, 1 is equal to the dot product between n and itself. So let's write that out. So 1 is equal to n transpose times n, right? Because that's just the dot product between n and itself. And now let's expand that expression. OK, so we're going to get what? We'll get d minus c times 1 transpose, d minus c1 transpose, and then we're going to get an x inverse, and then an x inverse 
inverse transpose times d minus c times 1, like that. <sighs> OK, and now um, we do a little bit of torture on your instructor, and we can expand the square here. OK, so I'm actually going to work from the last two terms back to the first one. So, you know, do, I, I, I've been tutoring high school pre-calculus on, on Fridays, and uh, it's been a good opportunity for me to practice my FOIL, right? Like all the ways that I can expand a binomial here. Um, OK, so in this case, what are we going to get? We're going to get c squared times 1 transpose. Oh, by the way, this, this guy here, this is the same as x transpose x inverse, which is kind of a nicer way to write it. OK, so we're going to get a c squared times x transpose x inverse with ones on either side. OK, so in other words, it looks like this. Times c squared. I'm going to glance at my notes to make sure that I uh, am not leading you astray. Uh, yep, we're good so far. OK, so now let's look at the coefficients of c. Right, so in particular, uh, what we'll get is, um, let's see, we have a 1 transpose, x transpose x inverse d, right? So, and we, we get two of those from the two outer terms, um, right? So we're going to get, uh, and this guy has a minus in it, right? So it's minus 2, 1 transpose x transpose x inverse times d, c, Notice that I'm writing this in a suggestive way. You probably guess where I'm going with this. And then finally, we have our constant term, right? So that's going to be plus d transpose x transpose x inverse times d. OK. So remember, our goal is to find c, right? Because c is the distance to our third vertex. Now we're in pretty good shape. In fact, in case it's not obvious to you yet, let's give these things names, right? Because these are all just constants, right? We know x and we know d. Um, so let's call this, uh, I don't know, a, oops, but I'm going to already have a c, a bar. Let's call this b bar, and we'll call this c bar. I know that c bar doesn't have anything to do with c. I'm the worst. It's, it's a problem. OK, so, so, so this is a bar c squared plus B bar C bar. OK? So now you see it. If we're trying to solve for C, what do we do? In fact, just for fun, uh, well, we can subtract 1 from both sides here. We're going to get, well, so we have 0 equals some quadratic expression in C. So in particular, C is equal to negative B plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. You have to be a little careful because there's a 1 here. All that over 2a bar, because why not? OK, so <laughs> let's step back 10 feet and see what we just did here. So we said, all right. I have some triangle, and I know the distance from a source point to two of the three vertices of our triangle. Moreover, I'm going to make this slightly false assumption, which is that the distance function takes this form for some unit vector that I don't know n and some scalar I don't know c. Now I plugged in my two points, and I got this matrix expression here, and I solved it for our normal vector n. We substituted in our unit norm constraint here, and then just followed our noses until we got to this quadratic expression in our unknown c, which leads us, just by our usual high school quadratic equation, to an expression for c in terms of all of our known quantities, right? This is just the only uh, objects in here are x, the vectors of all ones, and d. So now we're in pretty good shape, yeah? You know, we started with a problem where we knew nothing, and now we have a problem where we know something. Um, so our remaining task is a little subtle, which is to choose among the two roots here. And so now let's draw a picture. I'm going to go ahead and erase the board, and then we'll continue by looking at the slides instead of my ugly handwriting. Okay.
So thankfully, actually, our two roots here have a totally intuitive explanation from a geometric perspective. So let's take a look. Uh, in particular, if I only know the distance from our source point to two out of the three triangles, then essentially, remember that when we take the norm of a vector, we kind of forget its orientation, right? Like plus or minus n both have the same norm. So essentially, what we can think is that there's two orientations for n that we could have gotten. One of them corresponds to the planar front moving into the triangle through x3 and then x1 and x2. And then the other one starts at x1 and x2 and then goes through x3. Right? So essentially, there's always two roots because these correspond to two orientations of this normal vector to the planar front n. And what do we want to choose? We want to choose the one that gets to x3 after x1 and x2. Right? So remember that c is just the distance to the third vertex. And essentially, how we're going to choose c is we're going to choose the larger of the two values, which gives us a value of c that is bigger than d1 and d2, which is what we would want. Uh, so essentially, this larger root is sort of giving us a consistent picture. Remember that Dijkstra's algorithm is constructing bigger and bigger fronts that are farther and farther away from x0. So essentially, if we know the distances to x1 and x2, we necessarily know that the distance to x3, which we're still updating, apparently, um, should be larger. Right? So this gives us a way to choose uh, the root among the two choices here. Incidentally, one thing that I forgot to mention in our expression here, uh, oops, well, I haven't written it down, was that uh, at the end of the day, we wrote it in terms of d and x transpose x. So notice that d is just a vector of distance values. It didn't depend on that constant shift of our triangle mesh into that sort of canonical frame that we use to derive our formula. And actually, x transpose x is just like dot products between edge vectors for our triangle mesh. So at the end of the day, we didn't actually have to rotate our mesh into this canonical pose. That's just a sort of mathematical proof convenience uh, initially. There's one additional more subtle issue that comes up in this algorithm, which is that there are actually cases where neither of the choices of n uh, correspond to an ordering where d3 happens after d1 and d2. And that's illustrated here. So notice that that n vector that is being drawn here, right? there's two different choices, one that faces up and one that faces down. Neither one of those points into the interior of the triangle or into the complement above it. And so what you can convince yourself in this case is that the ordering is either like x1, d3, x2, or maybe d3, x1, x2, right? Like there, there, there's no choice um, of, of, of orientations for n in this case that gives us the order we want, like d1, d2, d3, or d2, d1, d3, right? Either one of those is okay. So what do we do in this case? In this case, essentially what it's telling us is that our planar front approximation is garbage, right? Because this should just never happen in principle if we really were constructing concentric circles that were getting bigger. Uh, so essentially, uh, we need to come up with some tiebreaker or some alternative update rule in this case. Incidentally, a fun exercise that I'm going to leave for you to do at home. This is code word for I forgot to check it before I, I started my lecture today. <laughs> is that essentially this condition happens uh, exactly when you have a negative uh, number in this particular vector that I've, I've written for you here. But in any event, um, right, so what's going to happen uh, in this case, again, is that we violated the rule that we have to reach x3 before x1 and x2. That's what I've labeled as bad here. Uh, and there's a number of different fixes for this issue. Um, probably the simplest one is to just default back to Dijkstra's algorithm along the edges of your mesh. So in, ignore the interior of the triangle. Don't use that planar front update. Right? So this would be the simplest thing to do, like just detect something went wrong inside of this triangle. Uh, and instead of that, um, use just a simple triangle inequality one. A very famous fix, which is actually what makes this algorithm convergent, is to take these triangles where this case can happen. It specifically happens on obtuse triangles. It turns out, and you just split them in half. So you just drop a, uh, an edge down so that now you have two different, two triangles where there was one and both of them are not obtuse. And then you'll see that that fixes the, uh, 
that this fixes the update rule. However, now you're updating on a mesh other than the one that you really wanted to be working with. So you have to decide whether that's the right thing for your application. Okay, so at the end of the day, the fast marching uh, algorithm is essentially just a simple modification to Dijkstra's. There's pseudocode inside of the course notes, but it really is identical. You initialize with you know, the distance to your central vertex being zero, everybody else being infinity. And now in each iteration, you grab the next closest vertex, you add it to the set S, and rather than looking at all vertices adjacent, you look at all triangles adjacent to your, your new update vertex and you use that fast marching uh, update rule that we just derived uh, to reduce the distance if you can. So that's basically it. So fast marching is extremely easy to implement uh, relative to Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, it's efficient and in practice it gives very good approximations. One thing that you'll notice, remember that the Iconal equation says if I take the distance, a distance function and I take its norm um, of its gradient, then I get one. Essentially, that got sort of encoded in our derivation by assuming that the norm of this vector n is equal to 1. And in fact, there's a really nice PDE perspective on the fast marching algorithm, which is that it's just a numerical solver for the Iconal equation. And that's roughly how people go about proving uh, some theoretical properties of, of this technique. Because again, it is an approximation. You do have to show some species of convergence. So that's a big warning here. You did not get the honest to goodness shortest path length from the central vertex along the interiors of triangle ver uh, faces as just you know, line segments to the final one. You got some approximation of that. Um, but it's a much better approximation than what you would get if you just did shortest paths along graph edges as I've hopefully convinced you by now. Now there are many different modifications and improvements to the fast marching algorithm. For example, uh, this paper in 2002 essentially says that you can also work out a similar update rule if you assume your wave fronts are circular rather than planar. The circular one includes the planar one as a special case, right? Because circles are planes as you make the radii really big. This is still an approximation. The, the, the true wave fronts are sort of piecewise circular. Um, but uh, th this can be a useful approximation and get higher accuracy, especially near the center point. Um, but if I recall, uh, it can lead to some numerical instability. There are also special variants of fast marching that work like specifically, for example, in um, grids or parametrized surfaces. These are kind of cool because oftentimes they end up looking like raster scan, like these algorithms for drawing shapes um, really quickly uh, using rendering. And so they, they can be parallelized in different interesting ways. Um, essentially, they're making use of a really regular structure to make fast marching algorithm really fast. One thing to note is that although fast marching is probably the best known and, and has the longest history of geodesic approximation techniques, there are other ones. So for instance, one very popular choice is something called the heat method, um, which goes back to a transactions on, paper, on graphics paper in, in 2013. Um, we're gonna largely defer on this algorithm until we talk about the Laplace operator. But the basic point of this heat method is the you can find distances hiding in all kinds of different geometric uh, expressions. And one of them is heat diffusion. So it turns out if you take one unit of heat at a point on a surface and you diffuse it out for an infinitesimal amount of time and look at the log of the heat distribution that you get, it ends up looking like minus distance squared. Those of you who are in machine learning actually already knew this, but you didn't know it was called this. So uh, the Gaussian distribution, right, like e to the minus distance squared, is the heat kernel in the plane or in, in Euclidean space, right? So remember that uh, Gaussian distributions look like e to the minus distance squared up to a constant. So if you take the log of that, then you can recover distance squared. So the heat method actually simulates that diffusion a little bit. Uh, that's what this first step is, is, is doing. And then, you know, in principle, you could just take the log of the object that you got, and this would be some approximation of distance. But because you solved a PDE with a really tiny time step, you end up with a lot of numbers that are really close to like numerical epsilon. They're really tiny. Um, so they have a heuristic uh, sort of set of steps for improving the situation. Those are steps two and step three. Essentially what they do is they take the gradient of the log of the uh, heat kernel um, and they compute a vector field and normalize it to have length one because we know that should be the case by the Iconal equation and then kind of integrate back out to get a better uh, heat uh, 
uh, or rather better geodesic distance. It turns out, although there are definitely some approximations here, right? Just like there are in fast marching or anything else, this is an efficient and very easily implemented technique for computing geodesic distance because many of us have Laplace operators on hand. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we'll, we'll return to that uh, in just a few lectures when we introduce the Laplacian. Incidentally, if I do this single source, all targets shortest path uh, style of computation, I can recover the geodesic curve from that source to all the other ones. And it's really simple how I do that. I just follow the distant function's gradient backward, right? So if I'm at some other vertex, I can look at its adjacent triangles, and the gradient of the distance function is exactly that vector n, right? So I can sort of follow n backward from triangle to triangle until I get back to the source, and you're sort of guaranteed to be able to do that. Now, all of these algorithms that we've introduced give you approximate geodesic distances. Um, one totally reasonable question is, can I get the exact single source, all target shortest path on a triangle mesh where I really just think of it as a union of little triangular facets? The answer is yes, this is doable, and it's doable in time that is similar to uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, which is cool. So this looks like uh, k plus uh, n log n here. Um, Oh, oops, sorry. So it looks like n squared log n total, where I think there's n uh, edges. Um, and remember that edges and vertices are roughly linear in each other on a triangle mesh. So this is called a discrete geodesic problem. Um, and there's a very famous algorithm for it. This is by Mitchell Mount and Papa Dimitriou uh, back in the, what, is it the 80s, the 90s? The 80s, I believe. Um, 1987. So it's an old algorithm. Now, this is one of these algorithms that was proposed in theory, and very few people use it in practice because it's really annoying to <laughs> implement. Uh, and moreover, the, the benefits here above fast marching are relatively limited. Um, the big idea of this technique, we're not going to cover it in detail. You should take like an algorithms, advanced algorithms course to see this sort of thing, is that it's yet another extension of Dijkstra's algorithm, but now rather than just updating the one ring of every vertex, we make this additional observation, which is that you have to subdivide every edge of your mesh into little windows, is what it's called. The idea is that a window on an edge is a sequence of points whose shortest path back to the original source all follows the same sequence of triangles. So you can see like this yellow window here follows this, this sequence of unfolded triangles. If I move outside of the yellow window, then it has to go through some other triangles to get back to S. Um, so essentially, it's like Steigster's algorithm, but what ends up happening is rather than updating one vertex at a time, you update one window at a time. In principle, this is an easy picture to draw, but as you can imagine, it's hard to implement because now you have to subdivide edges all the time. And moreover, just proving that this algorithm works is also a little bit tricky because, like, for instance, you have to convince yourself it terminates, right? Like, does every edge end up with a finite number of windows, or is there some crazy case where like, you keep like, biting off smaller and smaller pieces of an edge and never finishing it off? So I encourage you to do a little bit of reading about MMP. It's a cool algorithm. There have been some efforts to make practical implementations. Um, here's a well-known paper called Fast and Exact, uh, Fast, Exact and Approximate Geodesics on Meshes. Uh, and very nice of the authors on this paper. They actually give you an implementation of the MMP algorithm, including uh, some heuristics for making it faster, and then some additional heuristics that you can enable or disable uh, that make it even faster at the cost of being exact. <laughs> um, so you can see that many people approximate, and there's some follow-ups on this work too. So now we'll just, I'll highlight a grab bag of other to topics I thought you guys might be interested in uh, and can do some additional reading about. One of them is that this geodesic distance function Right, where you look at the function on a surface, which is given by the length of the shortest path from some fixed source point to all the other ones, um, has places where it's not differentiable. This is called the cut locus. We talked about this in our previous lecture. Um, and maybe I want a distance-like function, um, but that doesn't have discontinuities. Or maybe I don't like that shortest paths are unstable. Right, If I hop from one side of the cut locus to the other, then suddenly the shortest path back to P drastically changes. There's one cool method out there, which was proposed about 10 years ago, that computes something called a fuzzy geodesic distance. Now remember that the geodesic distance function is given by the shortest path from P to all other targets. The fuzzy geodesic distance takes two points, and then it's trying to somehow tell you 
the uh, distance of every third point to the geodesic from P to Q, or to a geodesic-like curve from P to Q. So the way that it does that is by measuring failure of a triangle inequality. So for every x, it looks at the distance from P to x and then x to Q, and subtracts to that the distance from P to Q, right? So this everything inside of the exponential will be zero if you're truly along the geodesic. And as x deviates from the geodesic, the thing in the exponential, I guess there's a minus, so it gets smaller. And what it constructs is a function on your entire surface, which uh, is easy enough to compute, right? It just requires computing two single source geodesic distance functions, but it's stable, right? So like, for instance, on this human model, there's probably one geodesic distance cutting across his front and a second one cutting across his back, which are pretty close to one another. Um, now you can kind of see those two regions as lighting up and they show that there's some useful uh, applications of this function for shape correspondence. Another fun extension might be, how do you compute geodesic distances on point clouds or on broken triangle meshes like these crazy figures you see here? Uh, one Eurographics paper in 2011 does this by building sort of a scaffolding around your messy triangle soup and following the triangles when you can and then using morphology and other tricks to fill holes when they appear. Um, you can also take that heat method I mentioned and make it work for point clouds, which is, is kind of a nice application. Uh, we mentioned all pairs shortest paths. This is another tricky problem that's an extension of the basic geodesic distance algorithm. In all pairs shortest path, you, your real task is to make a data structure, right? Because now you don't know ahead of time, you know, you're know, going to have some fixed 3D model and then every once in a while somebody's going to walk in and give you a new pair of points on that 3D model and ask you for the geodesic distance between that pair. Uh, and you want to make that query as fast as possible if you're given a budget of as much pre-computation time as you want on the original mesh. Um, so, or maybe not as much time as you want, but like a reasonable amount of time. There aren't too many papers on this. I highlighted one in the course uh, materials, which does so by sort of choosing some landmark points on the surface. And then when you get your new query, it starts with the geodesic distance between two landmarks and then tries to kind of modify it a little bit to be between your two query points. And there are also some fun applications that you can get directly out of these. So remember that we talked about multi-source geodesic distances. One thing they can be used to do is to segment a 3D model. Um, so for instance, here I take a 3D model and medical imaging, which is one of the big applications, maybe randomly draw, you know, 100, 1,000 points on this uh, object. And then I can compute something called the Voronoi diagram of those points, which is the subdivision of the surface into regions which are closest to each of my sample points. And it turns out that the uh, adjacency structure of that Voronoi diagram gives you a nice sort of coarse triangulation of your domain. Um, so I'll let you guys read a little bit more about uh, those style of techniques. One topic we're gonna defer on until we talk about Riemannian uh, geometry is high dimensional geodesic distances. So for instance, one really cool application of this, which I think is really clever, um, it has been proposed by this set of researchers and then they continue to kind of fight with it over the subsequent years, is to say, I can actually solve computer animation problems using perspectives from geodesic distances. So what they do is they put distances on the space of shapes, right? So like for instance, you know, if I have two poses of my hand, how far apart are they? And these don't have to be Euclidean distance. Like it might be that moving a vertex in a straight line is not really the shortest distance between two hand poses. I think that's right. Like if I take my hand and I turn it, you know, my fingers aren't moving on straight line paths. If they were, they'd, they'd shrink. <laughs> um, so once I equip some geometric structure on the space of triangle meshes, then I can use geodesics for animation problems, right? So like if somebody poses a mesh in these two different poses, and now I want an animation that starts on the first one and ends up in the second one, well, I can view that as a shortest path problem in my new metric on the space of shapes. There's also really nice applications of this kind of idea in the medical imaging community, actually, as we mentioned in the very first lecture in this course. Now, in the machine learning domain, geodesic distances do come up. Um, so for instance, oftentimes, you know, we gather data points and we're viewing our data points as sampled from some data manifold that we only get access to in a very noisy fashion. 
So one tempting thing to do might be to collect our data points, construct a k-nearest neighbor graph on them, and then use distances along that graph as a proxy for distances between points. And that turns out to be a little bit dangerous. So I've given you guys a reference in the slides here to one paper that actually shows that at least if you do the brain dead thing where you make the k-nearest neighbor graph and then you ignore Euclidean distance and you just make it an unweighted graph, the distances on that metric structure do not converge to even a constant multiple of like Euclidean distance. It actually converges to what they call, <laughs> it's one of my favorite phrases in a, a, a paper, right? They call it an unpleasant distance function on the underlying space whose properties are detrimental to machine learning. Essentially, the, this k-nearest neighbor graph network approximation of a series of points to put some metric structure on a point cloud is not so great unless you weight the edges uh, using their length. But there is some intriguing theoretical progress on these problems. So just in the last couple of years, for instance, there are statistical results that try to approximate geodesic curves where I randomly draw points sampled from some domain. I solve a variational problem on those points, maybe connected together into a weighted graph that I carefully construct. Um, then there are actually some gamma convergence results that tell you about like approximate geodesic distances that you can obtain by point cloud computation in expectation uh, that they maybe converge to the correct value if you construct your distance in a very careful way. Incidentally, this is the first appearance of an interesting term that shows up a lot in theoretical kind of geometry optimal transport called gamma convergence, which I always joke with my students is one of these topics that I reference a lot and have never actually read anything about it. <laughs> this is a relevant area of math to understanding the uh, convergence of a sequence of optimization problems into something smooth. And I won't claim to know much about it. I encourage you guys to look closer at this paper for some details and the people that are citing it. In fact, in machine learning, there are a lot of reasons to be careful about geodesic distances. So for example, one thing that you learn in your intro ML course is often that you can construct a kernel on Euclidean space by just doing Gaussians, right? Kernels are useful for support vector machines and other basic learning algorithms. It turns out that building kernels on manifolds is not as simple as taking e to the minus geodesic distance squared. In fact, that is a kernel if and only if your metric is flat, like you look Euclidean. Um, this is just a quick preview because in a couple lectures we're going to define the heat kernel, which is sort of the correct analog of this e to the minus distance squared Gaussian kernel that you, you, you see in the plane. And then finally, I'll conclude by remarking that just in the last year or two, there have been some renewed interest in practical aspects of geodesic uh, computation in high dimensions. And this has come from the advent of deep learning, generative modeling, and so on. So the kind of interesting thing here is that you can think of these algorithms that are trying to learn a latent space for your data as trying to learn some geometry on the information that you've collected. And now a reasonable question you can ask is how to compute the shortest path between points in that geometry. This is kind of similar to the point cloud thing I was just mentioning before. Uh, so there's some really interesting papers out there that say maybe in addition to learning my embedding, like learning some deep network that embeds my data into RN, Maybe I also learn like a Riemannian metric or some other geometric structure that allows me to compute curved geodesic shortest paths between data points with some interesting applications, which are definitely still emerging. I, I think they're not like 100% convincing quite yet. So for instance, here we have two images of a chair and then in the latent space, they computed geodesic and the chair kind of looks like it's rotating when they realize that as a sequence of images, which is pretty cool. So this is an emerging and fast moving area. These three papers I've put here are just ones that I found online uh, all within the last year or two. And no doubt by the time this lecture comes out, there'll be another you know, 20. The machine learning area is really amazing that way. So in any event, hopefully you all get the basic idea of how we compute geodesic distance in practice, at least on uh, simplicial complexes like triangle meshes using this fast marching algorithm, which is nothing more then some version of Dijkstra's algorithm that allows paths to cut through the interiors of triangles. But in doing that, we need to change the Dijkstra update rule to account for that. And when we did so, we did still introduce a small approximation, which is this planar front thing. There's also the MMP algorithm, which does it exactly, but is much more hard to implement.
and many other alternatives that we've kind of mentioned and I encourage you to read about, but maybe make use of machinery we haven't yet developed in this course. Geodesic distance is one of these really basic computations in geometry that is sort of hiding in a lot of problems. So what we'll see is that for every algorithm that we develop for solving another geometry problem, oftentimes we can go back and use it to compute geodesic distances. So for instance, once we talk about the Laplace operator and have a means of solving the heat equation, we can use our heat equation solver to implement that heat method I mentioned, and then you get a different geodesic approximation. Or later when we talk about optimal transport, we'll see there are many algorithms for optimal transport, for example, entropy regularization, sampling, and so on. Each of those will lead you back to a geodesic distance algorithm, in that case by taking the input data to be delta functions. So this is somehow a problem that's hiding in a lot of other ones. But it's useful to just know that like the basic techniques, namely fast marching, MMP, and so on, are really not so painful to implement, but that they make approximations. And incidentally, for good reason, uh, as we kind of justified when we talked about that shortest geodesic construction at the very beginning of the lecture today. So with that, we'll conclude our, def our, our discussion of geodesic computation. And in our next lecture, we'll flip our problem backward and talk about going from distances to geometry. So I'll see you then.